Hey, my name is Fernie. I'm the pastor here at Mid City Church, and I want to welcome you as we begin our Advent series here at Mid City Church. Now, if you don't know what the word Advent means, it's uh, the beginning of what most people call the Christmas season. Uh, it starts at the beginning of December. Uh, this year, it starts at the beginning of December. And Advent is just a time of preparation for the birth of Jesus, which we celebrate on Christmas. So uh, I'm excited for this series. We're going to be looking at Mary and her journey through this uh, story, and I'm really excited. So get ready, because here we go. Now, I know that I am a 34-year-old adult man who has a master's degree. I'm ordained as an elder in the United Methodist Church. I'm a husband, a father, I have a dog, and yet, I'm even a homeowner. And yet, one of my favorite things to do is to scare people. It sounds childish, I know, but it's so much fun to scare people. Sometimes Susie and I will be driving down the road, and suddenly I will scream as loud as I can to scare her. And and even though I get the same annoyed face from her every single time, she has stopped fighting with me uh, about it because she just understands that I am a kid at heart when it comes to scaring people. Back when we were recording online worship, we would usually wrap around uh, 9.30 p.m., which meant that all the lights in the building uh, were turned off. And I would sneak off sometimes and jump out and scare people while they were making their way through the maze of hallways at our main campus. Eventually, everybody just expected me to scare them, but it was still fun to do that. I will admit, though, that uh, sometimes I take it a little too far. So let me give you an example of that. One day, I was on Instagram Reels, and suddenly a video popped up that I just had to save. It was a video of a dad holding a baby wrapped in a blanket, and he was taking this baby to what you can only assume was the child's grandma. Now, while the guy is walking towards her, he suddenly trips over something. The baby goes flying in the air, and the grandma, in a huge panic, tries to catch the baby midair, but is unsuccessful, and the baby falls on the ground from about six feet high. Sounds awful, right? It was all a prank, though. The dad didn't really trip. He just pretended to trip. And inside the blanket wasn't a real baby. It was a stuffed animal. And once everyone realized this, they all started laughing. The mom pretended to be mad at her son for this prank. And and then the video just ends. After Abby was born, my mom came and spent a couple of weeks with us. And like any grandparent, my mom was really careful around Abby. She was always concerned about Abby being cold and was always clearing a path through the house uh, whenever we were walking with Abby in arms. And that's when the brilliant idea hit me. One afternoon, my mom got busy checking her work email. And you have to understand that when my mom checks her email, it doesn't really matter what you do around her. She is not going to notice because she is hyper-focused on her emails. Now, I used that as my opportunity to lay Abby down in her bassinet, grab a stuffed animal, wrap it in Abby's blanket, and walk back out to the living room without my mom even noticing. Now, since I knew she wasn't paying attention, I called out to her and asked her if she would take Abby. She eventually snapped out of her email days, and right as she was turning around, I pretended to trip. I threw the stuffed animal wrapped in Abby's blanket up in the air, and I heard my mom scream the loudest scream I have ever heard come out of her mouth. The panic fear, and anxiety that she exuded in that split second was enough to make me instantly regret doing this prank. But it was too late. This poorly thought out prank was already in motion and there was no going back. Now, before you judge me, know that Susie was in on this as well and she was also laughing hysterically along with me. My mom, not so much. Once she calmed down and realized that Abby was actually safe and in, asleep in her bassinet, she started to uh, yell at me and slowly, as her fear went down, she started smiling more and more. Honestly, even though as a 34-year-old uh, uh, who got in trouble with my mom, I would probably do this prank all over again. I'd maybe be a little more strategic about it, but I would probably do it all over again because I love scaring people. Here's the catch, though. While I love scary movies and I love haunted houses and I love scaring people, I hate it when people try to scare me back, and, and I, especially when I don't know that they're about to do it. Uh, 
So, for example, sometimes when I'm driving, Susie will scare me back the same way that I scare her, and that annoys me so much every single time. Sometimes if I'm walking through the halls of a scary building, I literally get so angry when someone jumps out because they make my heart rate spike. And if someone had done that baby prank on me, I probably would have lost it on them. I love to scare people, but I don't like to be scared back. Makes sense, right? You know, I find it interesting how irrational fear makes us sometimes. For instance, I've been scared enough times in the hallways of old churches that now, walking alone through a dark church hallway, I'm convinced that there are ghosts hiding around the corner coming after me. Or when I get a text message from a church member that says, hey, we need to talk. Uh, Fear rises within me so fast that I immediately start thinking that maybe I did something wrong or that they're mad at me or even that something is terribly wrong with them. And even when my parents call me over and over and over and over and over again, I convince myself that someone has died or that maybe they have bad news to tell me. But usually it's just my dad at the post office who needs an address from uh, someone's address. See, fear causes us to make a lobster out of a late season crawfish. It, It causes us to turn something small and usually insignificant into something major. So let me ask you, what about you? When have you allowed fear to get the best of you, and how did you react? I think one of the things that makes scripture so powerful is that if we look carefully, we realize that the biblical characters struggle with some of the same emotions that we do. So let me give you an example of this. So Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38 say this. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, How will this happen since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman who was labeled unable to conceive is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. Then the angel left her. Okay, so first let me start off by pointing out that the scripture tells us that Mary was confused and wondered what kind of greeting she had received. At no point are we told that she is afraid. But she must have displayed some sort of fear because scripture also tells us that the angel looks at her and says, don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Now, I must admit that many times I have wondered how I would react if an angel showed up before me like the angel did for Mary. Would I be scared? Would I be frozen in awe? Would I completely miss it? Or would I take off running? I have particularly wondered about Mary's fear because the angel seems to sense some sort of fear in her. But it also seems to quickly go away, and she's able to take in the angel's message. Eventually, she becomes so willing to allow God to use her. Uh, Whatever her fear was, it was prominent enough that the angel pointed it out, but small enough that it didn't hinder her ability to say yes. So I I wrestled with this question of why was she scared by the appearance of this angel, and then quickly moved beyond it. Well, as I was doing some research this week, I learned something that I had never learned before, and I actually found it quite interesting. So some scholars believe that the reason Mary was so afraid, but then immediately moved past it, is because she thought the angel was there to cause her or Joseph harm. So let me explain. In Catholic Bibles and in more and more Protestant Bibles, particularly study Bibles, we find a scripture, a section of scripture found right between the New and the Old Testament called the Apocrypha. Now, the Apocrypha is a collection of seven books that are called uh, intertestamental books, which basically means between the two testaments. And so these books were probably written sometime in the 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So when people ask, why was nothing written between the Old and New or for such a long time? 
Well, the reality is there was plenty written. And while some uh, do see these texts as canon, as official biblical books, for most Protestants and for some people, the authors of these books were not written by recognized prophets of God, so they, therefore they were not kept in the Bible. Now, regardless of whether they're used by us or not, the reality is that these stories would have been known by first century Jews and probably known pretty well. So Mary would have known these stories from the Apocrypha. And particularly, she probably would have known this story from the book of Tobit, chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. And, and maybe as I read it, you will begin to understand why the Apocrypha wasn't kept in uh, Protestant Bibles. So it says this, That same day in the city of Egbatana in Medea, it happened that Sarah, the daughter of a man named Raguel, was insulted by one of her father's servant women. Sarah had been married seven times, but the evil demon Asmodeus killed each husband before the marriage could be consummated. The servant woman said to Sarah, You husband killer, look at you. You've already had seven husbands, but not one of them lived long enough to give you a son. Why should you take it out on us? Why don't you go and join your dead husbands? I hope we never see a child of yours. Crazy, right? So let me explain what's happening here. According to this text, the woman named Sarah had been married seven times, but each time this evil demon named Asmodeus shows up and kills each and every one of them before their marriage can be consummated. And because of this seemingly endless pattern, people begin to judge her and look at her differently. In fact, in our story from Tobit, she somehow manages to make a servant so mad that the servant looks at her and, and tells her to go join her dead husband's. Now, in order to understand how bad of a situation Sarah finds herself in, it's important to understand why a wedding work, uh, how a wedding worked in the first century. So first, the father of the bride would arrange a marriage for his daughter. They would then get engaged and the daughter would go and live with her parents for a full year. Right at the one year mark, the groom would show up at his bride's parents' house and would take her back to his home where they would have a week-long wedding celebration, and they would invite all of their friends and their neighbors, and then after the week was done, they would seal their marriage by consummating. So legally, as soon as they were engaged, the marriage was already sealed. It just wasn't officially official until consummation. Now, the reason this is important is because if the groom died at any point after the engagement, even if they hadn't consummated the marriage, the bride would immediately be considered a widow and would have to live with that social stigma, which you know it wasn't a very good one because Jesus specifically has to tell people over and over again to provide for the immigrants, the poor, and the widows. Now, it's a crazy, fascinating story that is literally found in some of the oldest versions of the Bible. And, and to be honest, I'm not even sure that it's a factual story. There is truth in it, but it may not be factual. Regardless, the story of the evil demon Asmodeus killing Sarah's seven husbands before they consummated their marriage would have been told and retold enough times that enough scholars argue that it's possible that when the angel appears before Mary, she becomes afraid because she fears that this angel that has shown up before her is there to kill her husband and make her a widow. Now, like I said, this is just the opinion of some scholars. The reality is that we will never know the exact reason why Mary becomes so afraid. But let's pretend for a second that this fear of becoming a widow really is the reason why Mary becomes afraid. And the angel has to tell her to not be afraid. So suddenly, if we look at it through that lens, it makes a lot more sense why she can go from being afraid one second to being intrigued the next. See, as soon as she received the assurance that her worst case scenario isn't coming true, she is able to put that fear aside and be present for what the angel has to say to her. See, it's because her fears are calmed that she's able to receive the greatest news ever. Now, I don't know about you, but fear is pretty common these days, isn't it? Just think about it. If you turn on the news, almost all they talk about are the different wars happening all around the world. And if you turn on the local news, you mostly hear about violence and car accidents and really the worst of the worst events that have happened throughout the day. The political divide in our country just seems to be getting worse every single election cycle. Inflation has affected so many of us. In, in, in fact, the end of last year, by the end of last year, it was projected that about 20% of the Louisiana population was either behind on rent or unable to pay at all. 
I can only imagine that that number has increased since then. And it's not just the housing situation. Buying groceries makes me anxious because we can buy the exact same groceries two weeks in a row, and the second time is significantly more expensive. And there, there's fear around food insecurity. There's fear around access to health care. There's fear around making paychecks last longer. There's fear of an economic collapse. There's fear of government, government officials. There's fear of sickness and dying. And there's even fear about whether or not Jaden Daniels will win the Heisman. I think it's safe to say that for some people, there is a fear of the worst case scenario coming true. And in the midst of that fear, we miss out on the good because we can't get over our fear. But see, that's what Advent is all about. It's about realizing that no matter how dark the world may feel, Jesus, the light of the world, will soon be born and help us overcome this darkness. It's about realizing that this child that will soon be born is going to turn everything around. It's about realizing that no matter how broken the world may seem, or it may actually be, Heaven is coming. Friends, as we enter into Advent, we enter it in the midst of fear because the reality is that there is darkness in this world. But don't be so focused on the darkness that you miss out on the good news that is coming to us. That a child whose name shall be Jesus will soon be born. And when he comes, there will be no end to his kingdom. That because of this child that will soon be born, all the things that cause us fear will tremble because our fears know that they are matchless against Jesus. Friends, may you hear the good news of Advent in the midst of the fears of this world, in the midst of your fears. May you not miss out on the greatest news ever shared because you are focused on everything that is going wrong. May it be so. May you find this joy. Amen. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Mid-City Church Sermon Cast. If you would like to dive deeper into today's topic, visit midcity.church slash sermoncast to find a home sheet that goes along with this message. On the home sheet, you will find scriptures, questions to wrestle with, and a challenge that goes along with this sermon cast. If this has been a helpful resource to help you grow in your faith, we want to invite you to support our ministry here at Mid-City Church by giving today. To give, text the word GIVE, G-I-V-E, to the number 225-307-0662. Thanks and see you next week.